We all have smartphones these days, and we take them with us everywhere we go. How much could you infer about a person, their stage in life, their driving style, their work-life balance, based on just a phone's motion and GPS data? With the right mix of analytics and machine learning, it turns out you can learn a lot about a person. Are they a dog-owning workaholic or an early rising parent of young children? This week, you'll meet Vincent Spurt, who is the chief data scientist at Sentience, a company building an SDK to answer these exact questions. You'll learn how they're using Python to make this happen and how they think this data could be used for the greater good. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 135, recorded October 25th, 2017. Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is brought to you by Datadog and GoCD. Please check out what they're offering during their segments. It really helps support the show. Vincent, welcome to Talk Python. Thank you. It's great to have you here. You guys have a, a super cool platform. You're doing some seriously deep learning and AI and machine learning. And I think everyone's going to get a, a pretty cool look at what you guys are doing and how you're doing it. There's a bunch of cool algorithms going on here. But before we get into all that detail, let's talk about how you got into programming and Python, things like that. Yeah, sure. Cool. It started when I was about 14 and, and I started hacking around with some some web design. You remember those days where... Uh, Everyone used those marquee banners. There was no CSS and, and stuff like the that. The blink tag. Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> exactly. was wonderful. Those were good days. <laughs> exactly. So, and over the years, I went more into network security and hacking, started a company when I was around 18, and converted more to languages like Java and, and C++ throughout my PhD. What was the company you started when you were 18? Uh, it was a, a network security company, so quite different from what I'm doing today. It was a, a lot about uh, the, you know, back then, the, the internet was m- more or less the Wild West. Everything was, was wide open, so... Uh, Interesting times. <laughs> yeah, I remember back then that things like Windows XP was the most popular operating system, and it had no firewall at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, it was right on the internet. It was really bad. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, so yeah, those were interesting Wild West days for sure. And then you said you moved on to uh, C++ and uh, Java? Yeah, so during my... my uh... PhD. I, did, I was mostly working on computer vision, machine learning. Um, so that was heavily focused on real-time processing. So there, there most of the, of the work was done in C++. And then I joined Sentience about uh, three years ago to start out a data science team. So back then, Sentience was, was quite small. I think we were at five people. And we had to choose a, a main programming language for the, for the machine learning stuff, the data science part. And so I guess coming a bit from an academic background, I was looking for a language that... Um, that both had the ease of use as that MATLAB or R has, but on the other hand also is a, is a language that that, uh, that allows us to go to production and build scalable systems. That's how we came up with Python. And so since then, uh, Python has been my go-to. Yeah, oh, that's really great. Three years ago, I think it was probably on the border of whether Python was going to be one of the really dominant machine learning yeah, languages. Yeah. I mean, now it's it's like really a clear choice. But three years ago, it was just starting to be a clear choice, right? What other things did you consider and, and why in the end did you choose Python? The thing is that, that obviously you don't want to use MATLAB in a production system. Uh, <laughs> so then, then I guess the choice was uh, whether or not we would want to use a programming language like Java for, uh, for the data science work. And there has been some discussion around that because the, the data engineering team here at Sentience does most of the stuff in, in Java, you know, making sure everything is scalable, uh, all the infrastructure stuff is Java. Uh, but for us, we noticed that although we love Java, doing rapid prototyping, quickly coming up and testing testing your models is just much easier in Python. And actually, although there is a lot of discussion on whether or not Python is a production-friendly language, if you look at, at for example, YouTube, they also uh, use mainly Python for their for their whole platform. So it's quite powerful. Yeah, it's incredibly powerful. You look at some of the, the people or some of the companies doing really interesting things. YouTube is a great example. YouTube handles uh, like a million requests per second. <laughs> so that's a pretty insane level of uh, web traffic right there. And yeah, there's some other uh, really cool use cases like that uh, as well. So I, I guess the main takeaway is sort of the combination of it's quick and easy, 
but also you can go fully to production, like all the way to like real scalable levels of running in production, right? Yeah, indeed. And of course, the, the machine learning communities is uh, these days is, is growing. And, and I mean, the, the amount of, of libraries and support you have uh, for machine learning in Python is, is just huge compared to almost any other language. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you do at Sentience now? So I'm the chief data scientist at Sentience. So basically, my job is mostly focused on the on the research part on on, on building the algorithms together with the team, of course. So Sentience is a an AI company first. So so we are uh, currently with about fifty people, and about forty of them are actually technical. Half of them data engineering, and half of them data science. And with data science, we mostly mean uh, you know machine learning, signal processing building the the actual algorithms there okay that sounds that sounds pretty awesome like a a pretty fun job to be part of i'm I'm sure so i guess you know probably a lot of the listeners don't know about sentience maybe give us like a high level idea of what you guys do i you have this specific sdk that people can plug into their mobile apps and then you look at the behaviors and, and stuff. Tell us what the, the big idea is. Well, the, the idea is that these days, I mean, everyone has a smartphone in, in, to that extent that, that, that the smartphone is almost like an extension of your body. You, you continuously use it. And every smartphone is packed with sensors. You have accelerometer sensors measuring every small vibration of the phone. You have the gyroscope. Of course, you have the location subsystem. So what we do is we have a, an SDK that plugs in into the app of our customers, which are companies. And once the SDK is in the app, we start logging all that sensor data accelerometer gyroscope location we send that to our backend running on amazon cloud and there we have a bunch of machine learning algorithms that extract behavioral intelligence from it so we learn about your behavior what is your home what is your work location what do you do every day why do you do it can we predict your future behavior etc wow okay so i totally agree that you know it's it's a crazy world where we always have our phones with us like i would rather accidentally leave my keys at home and leave my house and lock <laughs> than leave my house without my phone you know what i mean so if you can take this information about what people are doing just ambiently and do more with it that sounds pretty cool so you take all the sensor data orientation accelerometer location things like that And you say you extract intelligence from it. So I watched, there's a video on your homepage, I'll link to it in the the show notes, where you have these different layers, right? Like one layer comes in and just takes in this ambient information. One tries to understand what you're doing. And then the other... What's the final one to try to create like these moments or something? Tell us about that. We start with a, with a, with a raw low level sensor data. And based on that, we do what we call event detection. So we have a whole bunch of classifiers that take in the sensor data and, for example, try to classify your mode of transport. Based on the vibrations of the phone, you can figure out is this, is this person walking, biking in a train, on a subway, uh, in a car, or for example, given your location, your current location, we want to figure out where are you. I mean, are you are you visiting the bus stop that is that is five meters from your location, or maybe if you're there in the middle of the night for five hours in a row, you're not visiting the bus stop. You're actually in the bar that is like 50 meters further, right? And so we end up with this whole timeline of human behavior. But of course, then you know what the user is doing, but not why he's doing it. So we feed this event timeline into our deep learning based prediction model. We can predict what you're going to do next. And that allows us to explain why you're doing something. You know, is this, are you in a car because it's your commute or because it's your shopping routine? Is this a business trip? Is it a leisure trip, etc. And then finally, indeed, we, we um, aggregate all that data, all those timelines over weeks. So we can come up with, with more like a profile. Are you a shopaholic, a workaholic? Do you, are you an aggressive driver? Do you have children? And that data we then expose back to our customers. That, that's pretty wild. It sounds really challenging because... Like you said, there could be a bar and then right outside the bar could be, and you could be sitting like right in the front, you know, with like maybe on a beautiful day, like the windows are open or something. And then right next to that is a bus stop. And so determining whether you're trying to go on the bus or you're trying to relax after work. That sounds like a real interesting challenge. Yeah, exactly. Even more, I mean, you, you, you can be in a bar because you work there. You can be in a bar because you just like to go for a drink. You can be there because you live in the apartment on top of it. So trying to figure out why a user is doing something is, is, uh, is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely taking it to another level. So 
what does your day to day look like? Do you do a lot of research? What kind of tools do you do to come up with some of these models? Do you write production code? What are you doing? It's a mix of both research and actually writing production code indeed. So most most of the time when we start uh, on a project, there is a research phase. I mean, there's a lot of reading papers, experimenting, usually just in, in IPython notebooks. You create your models, you validate them. Uh, but then at some point, indeed, we, we, we have to convert this, this code into something that is production ready. So, so then it actually comes or boils down to cleaning up the code, creating a nice object oriented framework, do unit testing, regression testing, you know, performance profiling, make sure that everything is scalable. Um, and then encapsulate it into an API so that, so, that, so that we can deploy this as a microservice. And finally, try to get a microservice running in, in a Docker image. And that is actually then when, when the data engineering team comes in. So the data engineers take this Docker image, refine it. Basically, they build a base Docker image. So we just customize it a little bit for our specific projects. And they help us to make sure that, that we can deploy it in a, in a scalable manner. That's cool. And do you guys deploy it to your own system or do you deploy, I forgot what AWS is container service is called, uh, but do you deploy it to the container service or do you have more control over where it lives and runs? It's our own system. So we try, I mean, we love AWS, but we try to be not too dependent on their specific services, mainly because we need to be able to move to different cloud infrastructures if needed also. Isn't that an interesting struggle? Like there's so many features and AWS and Azure, those are the two that have like a ridiculous number of things that the cloud can do. But the more that you like put those hooks into your system and those dependencies, like the more you're locked in. I mean, people used to talk about lock in like with Windows or with Mac or with iOS or whatever, but like the cloud lock in is a whole nother level if you go all in, right? Yeah, exactly. And of course, that's their, that's their business model. I mean, they try to get you to use or, uh, those uh, specific services. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Though. Okay, so go with your own container service. That makes a lot of sense. And for the tooling for R and D stuff, this is like IPython notebooks. And what other are the notable packages and libraries you're using there? It depends on the project, I guess. Um, obviously, we just we, we use a lot of, of typical libraries like Scikit-Learn for most of the modeling. When we talk about deep learning, it's usually TensorFlow and some Keras. For performance and memory profiling, we create things like flame graphs. For unit testing, we use uh, PyTest or NoseTest. Yeah, nice. Are you using like GPU clusters in AWS or is this pure CPU based? For deployment at inference time, it's usually CPU based. Um, for research, I mean, like training the models, we indeed use GPU uh, machines because it can take a few weeks before a model is trained. So that really speeds it up. Yeah. And how fast is it if you use GPUs? also weeks and if it's not gpus it's even worse yeah exactly so the, the, the last model i trained a few weeks ago i started using a i started, started out using a, an aws machine that was just a cpu machine with 36 cores and eventually i moved to a gpu machine where i where it trained about about two weeks and the training there i mean the loss went down about 10 times as fast as, as when i was using the cpu machines so. wow that's really awesome yeah and for performance and stuff you just get that basically dialed in, I guess. There's two parts, right? There's training and then there's answering the question, the inference bits. How do you sort of balance those things? Like, obviously, you're just going to train as much data as you need. But then what do you do for performance at that point? I mean, once you have the model built and you kind of have the library, you're using TensorFlow or whatever, you kind of like how much flexibility do you have to make it go faster? Well, that's a good question. And, and usually it's it's really just trying to balance uh, performance and cost, I guess. I mean, you can have a, a model with, with 3 million parameters and have a gain of 1% in accuracy compared to a model with 300,000 parameters, right? While the latter, of course, is much cheaper to, to be used in, in production. So um, a lot of the time it's, it's just um, balancing out those two. Okay, that's interesting. Do you sometimes build like super detailed models in the research phase and go, I think we can take it down to... 100,000 or whatever levels and then run that in production and get good enough answers. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, especially, of course, if, if you, some of our models uh, started out on the cloud and then at some point we realized, you know, we, we could actually deploy those on the mobile phone itself. So then, so then it's very important to reduce the number of parameters as much as possible without losing too much accuracy. So Yeah, that's really cool. And that's definitely a trend in the space to not have these tremendously powerful cloud infrastructures, but to push it to the edge, right? Uh, to the devices. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It's uh, especially with with you know Apple in in the, in the new iPhone has this X, uh, X11 chip, 
that that is like a, a dedicated coprocessor for for these kind of things. And at the, and, and at the same time, Google with the Pixel Two, they have this uh, separate chip specifically for like image processing, computer vision. So more and more phones will have coprocessors that allow us to uh, to do edge computing without draining the battery too much. Yeah, that's more or less like running on GPUs, right? Like these specialized hardware, are way more efficient and quick. So. Uh, more reasonable to run it on these wimpy devices. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, cool. So you said that you guys were about 50 people. What is the, and if I remember the breakdown right, 20 or so data scientists, 20 or so sort of data software website of things. Uh, what's the team structure? Like how do you guys work together and things like that we have a model that is that is like loosely based on on the spotify model they work with a or we work in a kind of a a matrix structure where horizontally we have a set of of functional teams so that there is a data science team there is a data engineering team then there is a mobile sdk team and then there is a solutions team but we quickly realized as those teams grow bigger and bigger that it's very difficult to isolate you don't want to want to be isolated in your team you want to you want to work together with people from from different backgrounds so that's why vertically over those teams we define cross-functional teams that we call squads so cross-functional team has a quite a specific focus it's kind of a of a mini startup and it consists of a few data scientists few data engineers few mobile guys they build stuff from from concept to actually build bringing it in into production that sounds really like a, a cool way to work actually so there's some new f- major feature or new library you guys want to build, and you put together these cross-functional teams to build it, huh? Yeah, indeed. Usually, cross those cross cross-functional teams or those squads are, are long-lived, so it's not like they are created and then and then uh, disbanded uh, quickly. Because of course, we continuously try to improve our product. So we have like a MobSense, what we call a MobSense squad, the squad that focuses on everything around signal processing and you know the deep learning directly on the sensor data. Then we have like a lifestyle squad that focuses more on the moments and the segments. So there, there we use more like NLP uh, related techniques. And, and of course, we try to move people around. I mean, you don't stay in a single squad forever. Of course. Oh, that sounds really cool. So let's dig into the three layers of your SDK, the event acquisition, the moments, and uh, the segments, you call them, right? So there's some pretty interesting algorithms and, and libraries you're using. So the first level is this idea of events. And the, the basic question you're trying to answer is, what is the user doing? So maybe we could talk about some of the some of the algorithms and techniques you're using to determine, like, are they driving? Are they walking? Are they at a bar, whatever. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, so transport mode detection itself is a is a cool problem. You know, both both iOS and Android already have a, what what they call motion activity, so they, they give you an idea already about transport mode, but it's quite limited. I think they support walking, biking, vehicle, and idle, something like that. Also, the accuracy are, okay. are quite low usually. So indeed, we had to build our own model to get better accuracies and especially to extend the number of transports we support, like bus and subway and and, uh, and running and stuff like that. Sure. Can you still leverage these like uh, motion chips? at a lower level and not just ask like, what are they doing? But, you know, give me the, the actual measurements that you were going to use to make that assessment. Currently we get 25 hertz accelerometer and gyroscope data from the phone. And based on that data, well, first, of course, there is some pre-processing, some, some signal processing. You have to interpolate the samples because they don't come in on, 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 a, regular, uh, on a regular grid, let's say. Uh, you have to do some bandpass filtering to remove the, the high-frequency components that, that usually contain a lot of noise. And then after that, when you have like a signal that is more or less clean, what we do then is, is a lot of data augmentation. Uh, we add some noise, you know, additive noise, multiplicative noise. And that is mainly because... Every phone has different noise characteristics and we don't want our machine learning models to learn to recognize specific phones. So to undo those noise characteristics, we basically deliberately add noise to our data so that the classifiers learn to to generalize. And what we then do is we feed that sensor data well, maybe it's interesting to, to have a look at the, the evolution. So today we use a, a neural net, a, a ConfNet, but we started out in a completely different way. In the beginning, we, we actually chopped our sensor stream into pieces of several seconds. Those pieces, for those pieces of or segments of sensor data, we did a lot of manual feature engineering, like some Fourier coefficients, um, like frequency domain features, time domain features. Those were fed into a random forest back then, and the random forest then outputs class probabilities. Maybe quickly define what a random forest is for people. Yeah, yeah. So a random forest is basically an, an ensemble of decision trees. So you can one of the most simple classifiers is is, is a decision tree where it's just a, like a binary search tree where you say, okay, if this feature is higher than a certain value, go to the left node, otherwise go to the right node, and you go through the whole tree until you have a decision on what is the transport mode. Problem is that decision tree is not very powerful, it quickly overfits 
to your data. So what you can do is just build, you know, a thousand decision trees, all a little bit different, all on different subsets of, of your data and your features, and then you end up with a random forest. So it's kind of a averaging averaging out all those predictions. Right. So kind of somewhat uh, combats against the overfitting problem you would run into. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. The thing, of course, is by chopping up the, the, the sensor stream in, into pieces of several seconds, you completely lose the temporal dependencies. It could be that one piece is correctly classified as car and the next piece maybe is incorrectly classified as walking so you still want to do some temporal smoothing so what we did back then is we fed that information those segments or actually the class probabilities into a hidden markov model and the hidden markov model is able to learn short-term temporal dependencies and kind of smooth out the end result so that 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 was our first version of the transport classifier and then over the, the over the past three years, we went through several iterations. So the Rhino Forest was replaced by by booster trees, XG Boost, which is used a lot, for example, in these days in the Kaggle competitions uh, you read about. And now recently, we figured out that that, that actually just uh, using a convolutional neural net with, with one-dimensional convolutions, because of course you don't have images, allows us to not only get an improved accuracy, but also come up with much smaller models that more easily fit in memory compared to these huge random forests. Okay, yeah, that sounds... Uh... Uh, really interesting. And thanks for sharing the evolution. I think that's pretty cool. And so you've got all these events. Okay. Users driving, users at work, users walking, users at restaurant, users walking, users at work, things like that. And then you try to create what you guys call moments, which is why are they doing this? Like, why are they walking? Oh, they're walking to lunch things like that, right? So maybe talk about the analysis that you guys do there. Well, similarly, there was an evolution on that level too. So <laughs> the main idea is that if you can predict what the user is, will be doing next, you can use that indeed to explain why he's doing what he's doing. So if, for example, the user is predicted to go to work, then the fact that he's in a car means he's in a commute. While if he's predicted to go to a shop, the fact that he's in a car means he's probably in a shopping routine, right? So the first step is to teach a model to be able to predict your uh, your next event. And there we started out with a, with a Markov chain-like approach. Markov chain basically just tries to learn transition probabilities. It just uh, learns a distribution over, learns to predict your the probability of, of your next event being event A, given your previous events. So it learns very short-term dependencies. We quickly saw, though, that, that those short-term dependencies were not able to model complex human behavior. So it worked in, in simple cases, like uh, especially if you include features like time and day, it worked in simple cases like going to work and going back home. But but what if, if suddenly, you know, you wake up an hour later than normally and, and your whole day shifts a little bit, um, then suddenly the Markov chain model completely kind of blacks out. Hey everyone, this is Michael. Let me tell you about Datadog. They're sponsoring this episode. Performance and bottlenecks don't exist just in your application code. Modern applications are systems built upon systems, and Datadog lets you view the system as a whole. Let's say you have a Python web app running Flask. It's built upon MongoDB and hosted and scaled out on a set of Ubuntu servers running Nginx and MicroWSGI. Add Datadog and you can view and monitor and even get alerts across all of these systems. Datadog has a great getting started tutorial that takes just a few moments. And if you complete it, they'll send you a sweet Datadog t-shirt for free. Don't hesitate. Visit talkpython.fm slash datadog and see what you've been missing. That's talkpython.fm slash datadog. What we use today there is, is, uh, is again, deep learning. We use uh, an LSTM. What's an LSTM? Long, yeah. short-term memory? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so right? an LSTM is, is, a, is a recurrent uh, neural network that is able to... So, when you think about deep learning, convolutional neural nets, for example, they are deep because you have a lot of layers. LSTMs, or recurrent neural networks, they are deep not because you have, per se, a lot of layers, but because they learn deep in the, in the time dimension. They learn a lot of temporal dependencies. As opposed to a Markov chain, where you only have a dependency on the previous event, an LSTM can depend on 20, 30, 50 events back in the past, right? It can say, okay, you know, 50 events ago, the user was in a car and 20 events ago, he was at a shop. And, and given all that behavior, the user is probably going to do this next. That's cool. Yeah, the, the longer you go without shopping, the more likely you are to shop and things like that for groceries, right? Yeah, indeed, indeed. And, 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 and the cool thing is also that the Markov chain model by nature had to be trained specifically for each user separately on the user's data. While the LSTM, we trained differently. We trained one global LSTM, feeding it thousands and thousands of different timelines of different users. The LSTM thereby kind of learned about general human behavior, and it learned how to 
what events from the past it has to pay attention to to predict something in the future. And then for a specific user that was never seen in a training set before, we don't have to fine tune or retrain the LSTM. We just feed the past three weeks of events into the LSTM and the LSTM already learned during the training phase how it should use that pass to predict the next event. So the nice thing is that you don't, I mean, if you have a mil million users on your platform, you cannot have a million deep learning models, right? To, that you have to retrain every second. Yeah, of course. And how do you mark them, right? Like all this stuff is happening without necessarily going, yes, I'm shopping now. Yes, I'm doing this. And then eventually it learns, okay, you're shopping. So I know what that means, right? This is sort of all inference based it's a combination so so on the event level on the lowest level we do have a lot of of label data so um we, we spend a lot of time with with customers or or even i mean we paid a lot of students to go out on the road take trains and trams <laughs> and bus <laughs> label the data and then internally we build some tools to clean up the data and, and, and make labels more accurate so we, we do have label data on that level of course when we go more to moments and segments it, it becomes very difficult to get your hand on label data indeed so there we we focus a lot on semi-supervised learning and things like transfer learning. For example, using using triplet loss function, we can learn this kind of, of high-dimensional feature space in which two users with similar behavior are close to each other and two users with a different behavior are far from each other. And then in that feature space, you can build very simple classifiers using limited label data to actually come up with a, with a user segment. So that's kind of a, of a transfer learning approach that, that allows us to cope with limited amounts of label data. Sure. Oh, okay, that sounds like it's working out really well. I've definitely been part of projects where it's like, all right, we're going to hire a hundred students to, you know, do this for an hour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you know, it's sometimes that's that's just what you got to do, right? Yeah, exactly. That's how we got started. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. But you can't pay a million students. Well, not much anyway. So, all right. So that's that's moments, and you have your LSTM deep learning model there, and then the final, like, the real end goal is to, I guess, moments is already probably an end goal. Like they're at this store because. Also, you want to classify people into groups, right? What type of driver are they? Do they work a lot? Are they parents? Are they teachers? Why are they at the school? Are they at the school because they're teaching there, because they're a student, because they're a parent dropping off a kid, things like that, right? So tell us about the algorithms and stuff in segments. That's a bit of what, what I was talking about earlier, so this feature space. The thing with, with segments is you, of course, some segments can be business rules, right? I mean, you're a workaholic if you work more than... A specific number of hours right? right but some segments like are you a parent for example that is that is less obvious being a parent definitely influences your behavior i became a parent six months ago and i'm a completely different person <laughs> but <laughs> yep. how do you capture that behavior how, how i mean you cannot put it in a, in a business rule right yeah so tell us how you can determine someone is a parent for example that's pretty interesting so what we did there is we we, we use deep learning to analyze the to compare actually the, the behavior of different people and to learn a feature representation, like a, a feature vector consisting of 50 floating point numbers, where each dimension, each floating point number encodes a different characteristic of the person. Maybe the, maybe the first number encodes your demographics, maybe the second number encodes how much time you go how many times you go to sport the difference with with traditional machine learning is that in this case we didn't manually define the meaning the semantic meaning of each of those 50 numbers instead we let our uh, neural network figure out on itself which dimensions it should learn to capture human behavior and once you have that you can actually take this timeline of events and code the whole event timeline into 50 floating points and then you have a, a rather small feature space with only 50, 50 features on which you can easily build, you know, even linear classifiers, very simple classifiers using limited amounts of, of labeled data. People, for example, from which we know they are parents. And it generalizes extremely well because your feature space is so expressive. And, and, and because the feature space was learned using unsupervised learning. So we can use all the data we gathered in the past to learn that representation. Okay. So you have these 50 classifiers or, or points that are sort of grouping people together. How did you determine like this grouping means 
it's a parent. Did you find some people you knew were parents and say, oh, they also have this feature that must mean they're a parent? Or how did you like assign values to that? Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of the feature space just allows us to do user similarity modeling. And then indeed, we do still need labeled data, just not a whole lot of it. We can find, we can ask 100 users to install our demo app, gather, walk around with the data for a few weeks, uh, with, a, with a SDK for a few weeks, tell us whether or not they are a parent. And then in this feature space, if we look at those people, well, other parents will be very close to them. That's how we can then build a, build a classifier to, to detect parents. <laughs> that's, that's pretty awesome. Do you feel like there are um, pieces that are missing? Like there's dimensions of human behavior that are not captured? Probably. Up till now, it works. It's, all, it's, it's also all, all very, very new to us because we started out also here with, with mostly business rules on top of our event sequences. So most of the machine learning in the past was on the bottom layer, on the event layer. It's only since recent, that, uh, re- recent times that we're also doing this unsupervised and semi-supervised learning on the segments and the moments. But yeah, probably it, the difficulty indeed if you use representation learning is that it's very difficult to control which dimensions the, the deep learning thinks are important to, to capture human behavior. So uh, so I can imagine that uh, that not everything is, is captured there. But in the end, you can easily solve that by fixing some of the bottom layers of the, of the pre-trained network and then training it a little bit more on a smaller set of labeled data, fine-tuning the upper layers, and that way it still, uh, it still is able to learn those, those things. Yeah, okay, very interesting. The dependency that you're talking about here sounds like it could be really tricky, like... Suppose you guys redesign your transportation mode detection, and it turns out some of the time you thought people were walking, they're just in traffic, but really slow traffic or something like this, right? Instead of every day taking a walk down I-5, the interstate highway, they're actually just driving in really bad traffic. And that probably has knock-on effects for moments, which has knock-on effects for segments. And so how much of like, if this this training of networks takes weeks potentially, how bad is it if you know you change the bottom layer? That's indeed a, a very actual problem we we encountered, especially now now that we are more and more using you know representation learning to learn these these feature spaces on the bottom layer. Indeed, if you retrain one of the models, the resulting feature space could have a completely different meaning, which means that all the consuming models that, that follow in the cascade would have to be retrained and of course you don't you don't want that. We solve this I guess in, in different ways. On on the one hand, there is a decision you have to make between deploying a trained model as a microservice that is then consumed by, by other models in the cascade versus actually just using the pre trained trained model and fine tuning it in a model that consumes that information. If you do it the first way, if you put it in a microservice, then indeed, if you retrain the first model, you have to retrain the second. But if you do it in, this, in the other way, if you just combine both machine learning models eventually into one model, then of course you don't have this dependency. So in this sense, we actually try to just use pre-trained models and fine tune them and embed them into the next model as much as possible and only go to a microservice if there is good reason for it. If your model for some reason is, for example, huge amounts of memories or a large amount of SQL queries to a database or something like that, then that is a good reason to actually put it in a microservice. That's one way we try to solve it. Another way that's something we're still working on, we don't have it today, is that we're trying to create a model that basically learns a locally linear mapping from your previous feature space to the new feature space after retraining or actually the other way around. So if you retrain a model, but you put a a mapping layer after it, then that mapping layer can actually make sure that even if the model is retrained, the new feature space is mapped to the same semantics as the old feature space. I see. So the inputs to the the next level model basically are literally transformed to look the same as they would have before. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a a pretty interesting uh, set of challenges and some some good solutions. But yeah, definitely it seems like that's... um... Something that's always going to be a bit of a tension. Yeah, exactly. And, and we're also, I mean, we're continuously trying to figure it, figure it out ourselves. I mean, there is also, of course, versioning, because if you deploy a new model, there there is a at least some period in which you're going to have to run both the old model and the new model in parallel, because not all the consumers will be updated at the same time. It's getting complicated quickly, but luckily we have a, an awesome data engineering team there to uh, <laughs> to help us solve all that. Yeah, that's cool. So one of the things I just wanted as I was looking through all this, like there's a lot of statistics and 
statistical inference and understanding these these models. So somebody who works on your team as a data scientist, like what's their general skill set? Like how much programmer versus how much statistician versus some other skill I'm not thinking of? It's a bit mixed. So in general, we say that everyone at Sentience is a, is a software engineer. So that means that every data scientist has to has to have good software engineering skills, not just some, you know, some MATLAB scripting experience or something. You, you have to be a software engineer, that's that's for sure. And then, of course, most people, we put a lot of emphasis on the, on the machine learning background. So most people in the data science team, they either have a, you know, PhD in machine learning or computer vision or something, or, or they have a background in physics or mathematics. They need an, an analytical mindset, let's say. And then finally, there is, there is the signal processing, which is kind of a specific field. So people from coming from robotics or from speech recognition or also image processing often have a have a good signal processing background. Um, yeah, it's quite challenging to 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 find people that uh, that combine all three of them. Yeah, I'm I'm sure, definitely sounds fun uh, in terms of projects you get to work on. You guys don't build apps, right? You basically provide this SDK or this API to customers who themselves build apps, right? Well, actually, we just hired a designer, but <laughs> but ourselves, we're, we're not a, the, the best in creating very fancy apps or something. Uh, we are really a, a tech company. And indeed, we, we have an API through which we expose all this information back to our customers. But the customer still needs a tech team. They need data scientists um, or, or, or developers to be able to do stuff with, with it. This portion of Talk Python to Me was brought to you by GoCD. GoCD is an on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery tool to help you get better visibility into and control of your team's deployments. With GoCD's comprehensive pipeline modeling, you can model complex workflows for multiple teams with ease. And GoCD's value stream map lets you track changes from commit to deploy at a glance. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. We all know that continuous integration is super important to the code quality of your applications. Choose the open source local CI server, GoCD. Learn more at talkpython.fm slash GoCD. That's talkpython.fm slash G-O-C-D. All this sounds so cool and like powerful and, and useful, but at the same time, it also feels like it could be a little bit invasive into people's lives and into their, their privacy. So what's the story around trying to strike that balance? That's a question we get a lot. And indeed, it, it, is a, it is a balance we have to maintain. There is a lot of information you can extract from the sensor data. I mean, even your personality and your mood, that's something that's on our roadmap, something we're looking into, not, not something we per se have today completely. But your personality influences how you behave and how you behave influences the motion of your phone so 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 there's a lot of stuff you can you can do with it and indeed then privacy becomes a an important question for us on the one hand there is a gdpr so the, the like the the, the recent uh, european privacy legislation if you look at the gdpr sentience is a data processor not a data owner which actually means that compared to let's say facebook or google or something we never claim that, that the data is ours. The data is still owned by the customer, which means we cannot combine the data with other data. We cannot sell the data. And the data is siloed. That's one thing. On the other hand, and probably much more important, is that we explicitly force our customers to ask consent to their users. So it cannot be that they use our SDK and, and put something in a small privacy statement, you know, hidden in the app or something. Our customers really need to be very upfront with their end users, tell them what kind of data they gather, why they do it. And as long as, as those customers provide enough value to the end users, that works. I mean, it won't work for, let's say, advertising solutions. Nobody wants to give consent to gather all this data to, to have better advertisements. But it does work for, for, let's say, health and lifestyle coaching. I mean, if we if we can help you live a healthier life, if we can contextualize your heart problems, or maybe even for insurance, if we can model your driving behavior and by that, by doing so, um, reducing the, the amount of money you have to pay to the insurance company, well, that is, that is enough added value for most users to actually give that consent. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess it's it's all about the, the trade-off for the benefit right like like you said no one's gonna go i would love to see better banner ads in my like candy crush <laughs> app or whatever yeah indeed the tech line of sentence or at least what, what our ceo often says is it, we want to make sure that ai improves people's lives and and it might sound a bit uh, a bit cheesy but but imagine indeed a world where where you don't have to adapt to all your sur your, your surroundings but instead you know your, your phone knows who you are knows what you feel knows what you want and the whole world adapts to you not 
to spam you or manipulate you, but just to, to make your life easier and healthier and improve your quality. That's the promise, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about being an SDK. Can you give us some examples of some of the apps that are using you, you guys as a service? Yeah, sure. There are different components, of course, in, in what we do. One of the, one of the components I, I, I quickly mentioned before is driving behavior, where we, in a detailed manner, model, um, you know, how aggressively you drive, how do you take your turns, what is your driver DNA, and that is currently being used by, I'm not allowed to name them, but but but, but let's say by the biggest uh, ride-hailing company in the world to actually uh, model the, the safety of their drivers, so not the passengers, uh, but the drivers themselves, so that they can coach them and, and make sure that uh, that the riders um, are safe when, when they take the, take the cab. Another example is, uh, for example, the, one of the biggest brand loyalty companies in the UK, so they have a, a huge user base of, of users that that installed their app because they want to get the latest coupons and and, and that kind of, of stuff and so there they, they use our SDK to just personalize their communication with with their users and and to make sure that you know the user is not spammed with information that they don't they don't care about but, in, but instead it, it's a, it's a very personalized communication and, and increased engagement right so maybe if you if you could tell them like this person is a parent versus this person is a workaholic or if they're both, you know, that they might treat them differently, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, if, if you know that someone is sportive, you can propose more interesting stuff than, than if you know, okay, this person never sports and indeed is a workaholic or something like that. And I guess may, maybe maybe the most most interesting use cases, to me at least, are in, are in health and insurance. So in health, for example, we work with Samsung, who is also one of our main investors, on detection of um, heart arrhythmia. So so problems with, I mean, if you have heart, heart uh, fibrillations and you want to contextualize that, you want to know why it happens, when it happens, and you want to expose that to your doctor. So your doctor can, can say, okay, we see that, that if, you, if you work late, and I see that you're a workaholic in general, and if you eat a lot of fast food that week, that is the time when, when you usually have your heart problems. So that's one of the use cases. How does it know? Do you have to like... Do you have a different device that detects the arrhythmia and like flags it in time and then you can overlay it on your timeline or something like that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and you said you're also working with another company doing something similar? Yeah, so there is a, in the health space, we work with, with, with some smaller companies also from from Europe and Belgium and, 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 and the Netherlands more specifically. So there is a FibriCheck, for example. FibriCheck, they have a mobile app where you can put your finger on your camera and the app will, will use the camera and the flashlight to extract your heart rhythm from the blood flow to your finger strip. And so they're also <laughs> and, and they're also they use our SDK to contextualize that to to predict when you're probably are gonna have heart problems, um, why it's happening, and to expose this uh, to a doctor. And then there is another example, Medap. Medap is a is a company in the Netherlands. They have a an app for care adherence, medical adherence. And that, that, so, so a lot of people have to take a lot of pills and a lot of people actually forget to take their pills. And that's a, a huge problem. So what they did is they, they, they developed an app that reminds users to take their pills on time. But of course, if you just get such a, a reminder, you know, an alarm on your phone right before you have to go to work or maybe when you're even when you're when you're in the car, then you just snooze the alarm or dismiss it and you forget about it altogether. So they use our SDK again to tailor those alarms to make them contextual aware and uh, remind users at the right time. Right. Like if you're driving, it makes no sense to remind you. So wait till you get to work. Exactly. Or wait till you return home if it knows you're coming home or something like that. Yeah, indeed. Or if we predict you will probably be leaving for work in, in, in 10 minutes, then this is the time to remind you and don't wait 10 minutes yeah that'd be even better cool so those sound all really interesting we talked a lot about your architecture already actually but there's a few things that we haven't touched on that i think are, are worth covering one of the things you guys use is something called devpy um, it's sort of an alternative local pi pi tell people what devpy is and how is it helping you guys the problem we had with Python and, and well and, and PyPy as a as a package server is that you quickly end up in kind of a dependency hell. You have you develop your um, project, put it in a repo. You have a setup.py to easily install it, and as the requirements, you list let's say NumPy version X, but also you you list uh, package Y as as a dependency. But package Y actually depends on NumF NumPy version Z version Z. So you have this you have this whole conflicting set of, of dependencies which quickly becomes um, very difficult to manage and how we actually did, did versioning of our own packages our so our our repositories is in the past we specified a version attribute in the setup.py and used git tags on bitbucket so on your on our uh, git repositories and those tags also contain the version number 
and that kind of allowed allowed us to you know pull the the correct version and and try to to get everything installed as it should be but but then you have to make sure that you maintain the setup of pi don't forget to increase the the version number there make sure the texts are in sync and it, it really becomes messy quickly so how we solve this is indeed we use devpy these days we have our own package server our jenkins uh, server so jenkins basically is our build server everything gets built out uh, built into packages automatically there jenkins builds wheels from our internal repositories, builds those wheels both for Mac, for the developers, and for Linux, for actual production. And it stores that with a version number. And then if we, if we do pip install something, then first our devpy is consulted. It fetches the correct version, the package with the correct version and correct dependencies. And only if it cannot find it there, it goes further to, uh, to PyPy. Yeah, that's really cool to be able to control it like that. Do you distribute your own packages for use on other projects within your own devpy? Everything we built is contained in a like a functional re- repo, let's say, with, with an API. And then we always have a, a microservice wrapper repo that just uses that functional repo as a dependency. So the functional part is always built by Jenkins, put into devpy, and can then be used by, by different other pro- projects as a dependency. Yeah, okay, that sounds really like a really good setup you guys have going there. Another thing that you talked about is pragmatic use of deep learning. Mm-hmm. Tell us what what do you mean by uh, like pragmatic use? Like, what are some of your recommendations? Deep learning is cool, and and especially if we hire new people and they they, they hear that we do deep learning, we use it a lot. Actually, they are eager to also start using it for 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 the problems they start working on. But but of course, we have to be pragmatic indeed, in in the sense that a lot of problems just don't need deep learning. For example, if we if I talked earlier about uh, detecting whether you're at home. Well, what is your home location and what is your work location? You can solve that without deep learning. You know, you just do some feature engineering, gather a little training data, and and train a linear uh, support vector machine on top of it or something. It's important, I think, to use deep learning if it really solves your problem, if, if it makes your product better. But indeed, don't just follow the hype. <laughs> don't just do it because it's a buzzword. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> more VC money because of it. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Like sometimes just standard algorithms and yo. If cases effectively, right? Or really all you really need sometimes. It is true that these days with, with VCs and, and even for customers, for some reason, it's, it's sometimes almost sounds embarrassing if you have to tell them that for, for a part of your product, you use traditional machine learning. It's like, why, why don't you use deep learning? <laughs> but it's a matter of cost. It's a matter of accuracy and also maintainability. I mean, if you have a, a very simple... Actually, I think it goes even further than the simple SVM example I gave. If you can solve a problem by a simple business rule, then that's the way you should go. Right, absolutely. Let's take just a moment and like take a step sort of up this higher level, not anything that you guys are doing in general, not referring to your product or, or your mission, but just in general. Like there's some people like Elon Musk, who I'm a big admirer of in general, and others saying like we should be really w- worried about AI and machine learning and other people saying now this will make things lots better. And you've given us some definitely examples Definite examples where it is going to be better for people, right, with like health, for example. But where do you land in this debate? And do we live in a simulation? First, the extreme example that, or the extreme case that, that you sometimes read about, about, you know, AI taking over the world and, and, and stuff like that. Well, an interesting quote there, I think it's from Andrew NG, so one of the one of the big deep learning guys who used to be um, head of AI at, at Baidu, and I think today is still head of, of AI at Stanford. He, he said at some point, you know, that, the fact or talking about AI taking over the world is a little bit like talking about overpopulation on Mars. It might happen at some point, it probably will, but there is still no clear path to it, right? So so <laughs> that's one thing. Of course, it is true that AI or, or machine learning, which I like more as a, as a term actually, is becoming very powerful and in, and, and in that sense like like any powerful tool it can be used for the good and the bad. So so I do agree that that we need politics, we need legislation to be ready for this. We need to make sure that governments are limited in what they can do, you know, that, that they cannot force you to install an app that, that uh, tracks your every movement so that they can then control you, control your future or something like that. that, that so, so, so I do agree with Elon Musk on that point, that, that it's time for uh, government officials to take this serious and to work on, on, on the legal aspect there. Sure. I, I totally agree. And I, there's other interesting knock-ons, like I think the EU is working on this. You know, when we get to things like driverless cars, if the driverless car is in an accident and it turns out the driverless car was at fault, 
who is responsible and how do you address that? If it's pure like deep learning, totally unsupervised learning that made the car drive, like how do you even know why it crashed? Yeah, indeed, and that's also a good example of of uh, of the difference between technology maybe being ready soon and the world being ready for it. Because even if we would have completely very good self-driving cars today, then still, we, exactly because of, of the reason you mentioned, we, we wouldn't be able to use them on the road. So first, uh, a whole transformation in the mobility sector, in the insurance sector has to happen so that cars are actually seen as a service where, where, you, where you insure a service. It's a different mindset. Yeah, and I think we're going to have to get used to pushing the benefits in an aggregated way instead of a specific individual's responsibility way. For example, yeah, the self-driver car did something really bad and it crashed into some people on the sidewalk. But if you look at it as a whole, half a million fewer people were killed in car accidents this year. So this is a horrible news story and we're really, you know, it's really bad. But taken as a whole, self-driving cars are doing better for people. Right? That's like a theory I'm imagining, right? But I, I can see the world struggling with those sort of ethical trade-offs. Yeah, indeed. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit, I know it's may, maybe it's not a very good comparison, but if you think about the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of people that were so scared about about all the millions of jobs that would be lost if cars would not be made by hand anymore, but if machines would be used, you know. And But in the end, when we look back, I I do think that most people agree that the Industrial Revolution made our life healthier, we live longer, made it easier, we're happier. And the same thing is going to happen with, with the AI revolution. Yeah, I think that in the long term, that that's definitely true. Like, I definitely wouldn't want to live pre-Industrial Revolution <laughs> myself. I wouldn't trade my spot in it now. All right. Well, uh, Vincent, I think we're going to have to probably leave it there for our, our topics, but that was a super interesting look inside what you guys are doing with machine learning and, and things like that. So let's get to the two questions. First one, favorite Python editor. What do you open up if you're going to write some Python code? Ah, PyCharm, for sure. <laughs> I love the, the JetBrains product in general, you know, data grid for database stuff, IntelliJ for Java, uh, PyCharm for Python. Yeah, yeah awesome. Yeah, me, me as well. That's my favorite. All right, and a notable PyPI package? I've been thinking about this for a long time. I think it would be Python Flame Graph, just because it's it's a, it's a very cool way to, to do memory and performance profiling, create Flame Graph, see which methods in your code are the bottlenecks, and optimize them. Yeah, I looked at that just a little bit, and it, it looks like a very powerful way to like quickly visualize where your performance problems are. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And to actually yeah. dig deeper in, in, into the stack of, of method calls and, and figure out what's happening. Yeah, that's cool. So I'll put a link to the GitHub repo for Python Flame Graph, which has a bunch of nice pictures. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, this final call to action. People are excited about deep learning. They're excited about what you guys are doing. What do they do to get started? We're expanding. We're continuously expanding. This year or coming year, we should grow from 50 to 80 people. So we're always looking for passionate Python developers, machine learning guys. Can they just reach out to you like on Twitter or something like that if they want to get more information or how do they find out? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just, uh, you know, ping me on Twitter or LinkedIn or go through our website um, where there is a more official uh, channel. Maybe, maybe you can uh, refer the podcast um, to have, so we have an idea where you're coming from. Don't focus too much on the machine learning part either. If you're very good at Python or very good at machine learning or, or signal processing, um, we should talk. Okay, awesome. And then you guys have an app. Even though you said you don't build apps, you have an app. <laughs> and what's the uh, what's the story with this app? Yeah, it's a demo app because if, if our product is quite technical. And, and so, of course, customers ask like, okay, how does it look like? What can I do with it? So indeed, we built a, a small demo app. It's called Journeys. You can find it on our website or on the App Store or Play Store. And Journeys, basically, when, when you install it, after a while, it will learn about your behavior. After one week or two weeks, you will see pop up a whole set of segments that we assign to you, your moments, your home and work detections. So yeah, check it out, download it. It's it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And, and there is also a way to give feedback. So if something is wrong and you decide to give feedback, well, that helps us to uh, to retrain our models. Oh, beautiful. All right. Well, thanks for sharing your story and what you guys are up to. It was great to chat with you. Thanks a lot, Michael. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Our guest has been Vincent Spurt, and this episode has been brought to you by Datadog and GoCD. Datadog gives you visibility into the whole system running your code. Visit talkpython.fm slash datadog and see what you've been missing. They'll even throw in a free t-shirt for doing the tutorial. GoCD is the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery server. Want to improve your deployment workflow but keep your code and builds in-house? Check out GoCD at talkpython.fm slash gocd and take control over your process. Are you or a colleague trying to learn Python? Have you tried books and videos that just left you bored by covering topics point by point? Well, check out my online course, Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps at talkpython.fm course.
to experience a more engaging way to learn Python. And if you're looking for something a little more advanced, try my Write Pythonic Code course at talkpython.fm slash pythonic. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes, Google Play feed at slash play, and direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Now get out there and write some Python code. (laughs) 